How many of you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Can I get a feeling for that? That's about 90%. That's pretty good. Yeah. And I'm being facetious, of course. I believe in the spiritual gifts. Mine is flippancy, okay? So, but um, those of you that uh, know, have heard me on radio know this, but let me just introduce our ministry is, de- is derived from two discoveries. And I can tell you about them, but that's meaningless. That's called hearsay. I want you in your studies to confirm what I'm about to describe. You have to discover this for yourself. The first discovery is you have, hopefully in your, in your lap, a collection of 66 books we call the Bible. How many have one of those? Okay, good, okay. It was written by over 40 guys who didn't even know each other over a period of almost 2,000 years. So get the picture here, 66 books over 40 authors, and yet out of this we make two discoveries. The first is that these 66 books, even though they're penned by 40 different people over a period of almost 2,000 years, are a message system that is specifically designed, it's skillfully designed as an integrated package. And I don't mean thematically that there's a, theory, a theme in the Old Testament fulfill new. No, 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 much more than that. Every number, every place name, every detail you discover is there by deliberate design. Now, that's staggering because you've got 40 guys over 2,000 years. Did they collude? Did they conspire? No, they didn't even know each other. But when you discover that it's been designed that skillfully, that every piece is required for every other piece. Once you discover that, you stumble into a second discovery that's even more staggering. And that is that the origin of that package had to come from outside time. Because it describes history before it happens with a precision that's flabbergasting. And so those two discoveries is what I hope you will endeavor to discover in your own studies. The integrity, once you discover that integrity of that package, it will change your life, change your whole attitude about the Bible. And so that, uh, the question I want to touch on here, you hear people talk about, are there hidden messages in the Bible? Uh, how many think there's hidden messages in the Bible? Okay, it's about a third. Okay, that's good, okay. The Bible says so. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the duty and honor of kings to search them out. And so I want to give you a riddle. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah. Methuselah. Good for you. Someone read it. That's good. Okay. <laughs> now, now, the question is, yeah, he lived for 969 years. It's the longest lifetime described in the Bible. Methuselah, right? Yet he died before his father. No, ah. How can he be the oldest man in the Bible... And yet he died before his father. Anyone figure that out? See, everybody forgets who his father was. You see, his father was a guy by the name of Enoch. Yeah, Enoch didn't die. There you go. That's a tricky, tricky deal. Okay, but, but the thing is about Enoch, he's an interesting guy. Because at the age of 65, something happened in his life, okay, that he walked from that point on with God whatever that means. Enoch, interesting guy. Now, something else you need to know is the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. The flood of Noah had been preached on for four generations. But Enoch was told when his, boy, when his son was born that as long as his son is alive, the judgment of that flood would be withheld. And that's why he names him Methuselah. Now, the name Methuselah comes from two words, two Hebrew words. The word muth, which means his death. That word occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And also the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah is, means his death shall be sent forth or, or shall bring. So all this is hidden behind. And by the way, if you do your homework in Genesis chapter 5, Methuselah was 187 when his son was born. Lamech was 182 when Noah was born. And it's in Noah's 600th year the flood came. So you discover the flood did indeed. Let me get that a little back again. Did I I mess that up? Yes, I did. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Well, we got we get this thing is acting up again. Okay. Okay. Genesis chapter 5 is one of those wor- uh, chapters you tend to want to skip over. Genesis 1 is the creation, that's big stuff. Genesis 2 is the man and all that. Genesis 3 is the seed plot of the whole Bible. Every theme of the Bible starts in Genesis 3. And Genesis 4 is the first murder. There's action on. When you get to Genesis 5, it's a family tree, it's a genealogy. And yet, and yet, there's something hidden away in that I want to show you. In Genesis 5, you have a genealogy, a family tree of 10 people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, no, 10 guys. See, the problem with chapter 5 is those names are not translated for you. They're transliterated, meaning there are, those are approximations of how they were pronounced. Follow me? But the Hebrew language is unique in that the letters, the alphabet, isn't just phonetic, how they sound, they also carry meaning. They're semimes, not just phonemes. So, uh, so the, let's take a look at the four names. Adam is pretty straightforward. What does Adam mean? Adoma means man. No problem so far. Okay. And so he had a son by the name of Seth. Seth means appointed. And in fact, Eve explains that to you back in chapter 4. She says, Eve said, For God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. All right? She saw Seth as a replacement appointed. And, uh, you know, everybody always asks, where did Cain get his wives? Anybody know where Cain got his wives? He married his brother's sister because he was Abel. Okay? Yeah, it's quite straightforward. Okay. You know, that's a great, I'm glad to get that. You know, I, I do to some audience, I mention that, and I get a blank stare, you know. <laughs> no, you, I was, okay. Anyway, well, then we get to Enosh. Now, we've mentioned him already, but what does his, uh, oh, excuse me, his son is called Enosh. What, uh, uh, it, it, it means mortal, frail, or miserable. It comes from a Hebrew word called Enosh, which usually used of something incurable, like a wound or a grief or something like that. Okay. Now, he has a son by the name of Kenan, not Canaan. That's an error in some Bibles. Kenan. And uh, so, which can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy. That's a tough uh, name to go through school with. Can you imagine that? Hey, sorrow, you're on our team, you know. Doesn't really work, does it? So, so he's tired. He and his father had these miserable names. So he decides when he has his son, he gives him a fabulous name, kind of a mouthful, but quite a name. Mahalalel comes from two Hebrew words, Mahalalel, which means the blessed or praised one, and El, the name of God, okay? Mahalalel, the, the praised God or the blessed God, okay? He has a son by the name of Yarad. Yarad is a Hebrew word, which means shall come down, and there's a story behind that I'll spare you in an interest for the, t- the time we have here. His son is named Enoch. Now, we've talked about Enoch already, but what does his name mean? It turns out it's an academic uh, phrase, which means commencement or teaching. And uh, he has a, na- a son by the name of Methuselah, which I've already mentioned. That means his death shall bring. And it was the, the year that the flood, that the Methuselah dies, the flood comes. Can your girls imagine raising that kid? Whenever he caught a cold, the entire neighborhood would go into panic. As long as he's alive, it's the, the, flood, the judgment of the flood will be withheld. But when he dies, the flood can, And it turns out that's exactly what happened. In the 600th year of Noah, the flood comes. Well, Noah, uh, uh, he has, excuse me, uh, Methuselah has a son by the name of Lamech. Now, here's a case where the word is in the English even still. And the, it's a root that we use in lament or lamentation. The word Lamech means despairing. Make, it fits, okay. And Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? Pastor, that's about 60%. I, you, you got a little work to do here. No, okay. I'm kidding, of course. Okay, good, Noah. Which is, that Noah's name derives from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. In fact, uh, the, his name means comfort or rest. 
And his, his father mentions that in chapter 5. It says, he called his name Noah, saying, the same shall comfort us uh, concerning our work and toil and so forth. Okay, so now we have a genealogy in Genesis 5. But with that little Hebrew lesson, you now can read the genealogy translated, okay? Okay, Adam meant man. So far, so good. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Who is right? You know, every time... Every time I do this, I get goosebumps. Because notice carefully here, the blessed God shall come down to... Who's... Whose death, whose death shall bring? God's death. You've got to be kidding. Yes. God knew when he created man that man would get himself into a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would avail to get him out of that predicament. And that's exactly, there's the summary of the entire New Testament in a genealogy in the Torah, in the books of Moses, right up front. Now, this has a lot of implications. This tells you that God's plan was not a knee-jerk re reaction to a surprise. It was planned before the, f the creation of the world. The Father and Son made this deal. Now, the other thing it tells you, there's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah? No way. This is placed there by the Holy Spirit. Breathtaking. See, one of the things I want you to understand with your Bible, every detail is there deliberately. And most of them have several different implications, not just one. There's a story that's very true. The details are true. You can trust them. On the other hand, the details in that story often tell another story in addition. And you need to discover that for yourself. Okay, integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I often threaten to, when I give, invited to, to a church to, uh, let's get rid of that thing there, uh, a church to give a talk. I was going, let's, we're going to, let's get together tonight, and I'm going to tear a page out of the Bible that's not necessary. That'll smoke out all the fundamentalists to find out what's going on here. <laughs> And then with great ceremony, we'll tear out the page between the Old and New Testament. It's one book. It's integrated. And let me give you an example of that. I'd like to re review a story. I know you know the story, but we'll go into it quickly. Called The Brazen Serpent. It's in Numbers 21. And let's just take a look at Numbers 21, starting about verse 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, ye have brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, the manna. And the Lord said, sent fiery serpents unto the, among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. And fiery is a, a very uh, piercing form of, 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 of a burning sense of uh, the, these serpents. It continues, therefore, now the people are shook up by this, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord, against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. But notice verse 8, interesting verse. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it up on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You get the idea? Okay. Now, and of course, that's exactly what he did. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, that's pretty neat. I'm sure that was a great relief to the problem. But let's stop a minute. Isn't that kind of weird? You know what you can do sometimes is take a notebook and go through the Bible and notice the weird solutions God uses. Here he's using a brass serpent on a pole, and if you look at it, you're going to be healed. Terrific. 
Do you know that nowhere in the Old Testament is that explained? It happened, it's a rule, but why a brass on it? Nowhere is that explained, by the way. In fact, it gets, it, it, uh, it's a pretty strange remedy. A serpent? Isn't that a figure of evil or sin? And it's brass. Well, that's a metal that could handle meat, so that, uh, uh, heat. So that was a speck of judgment. But in fact, about a thousand years later, Hezekiah discovers that that brass serpent is still around being worshipped by people. And he destroys it. And it says, he, he, uh, speaking of Hezekiah, he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father uh, did. And he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. They were worshipping this thing. And he, he called it Nehushtan, a, a thing of brass. He destroyed it because it became a fetish. But nowhere does it explain what, why did God use that rather weird way of healing people back in Numbers 21. Okay. Do you realize it isn't until you get... Oh, and by the way, why are these stories in your Bible? For several reasons. One of which is these things happened unto them for examples. This keeps doing that. Examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world come. In other words, these stories have a lesson for each of us. Well, why would we care about the brass serpent back in Numbers 21? Well, um, these are examples. And so a figure, a pattern, if you will. Well, it isn't until you get to the New Testament in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus, the primary teacher in those days, came to Jesus at night. And in John chapter 3, verse 14... Jesus explains for the first time in the Bible why that happened back in Numbers 21. Here Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that whole setting gives rise to the most famous verse in the entire Bible. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but ever have everlasting life. Now stand back and get the picture here. Back in Numbers 21, God plants this plot device. If you're writing a novel, this would be like a plant of some kind. He places that back in Numbers 21 in anticipation of John chapter 3 where Jesus explains it for the first time, and suddenly you realize the whole thing's been designed. That's the reason I picked this out, is it's just it's one of many examples, but where an event in the Old Testament may not seem to make any sense in the context of the Old Testament, but it carries huge implications in terms of the total package. You with me? Okay, so, good. For God so loved the world. Why is that, why is that verse so well known? For God so loved the world that he, he uh, that he, uh, oops. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall, uh, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you realize that that is the greatest uh, uh, being to the greatest degree, the greatest affection, to the greatest object of love, the greatest act, the greatest treasure, the greatest relationship, giving the greatest gift to the greatest company, for the greatest trust in the greatest object of faith, each one of these is a superlative of its kind. Every one, of the, every one word. So you can t- take that apart sometime in your devotions on your own here. So the greatest blessing. My goodness. And here's a summary of it as he continues here. For God sent his son into the world to con- he, not, he, he, God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And by the word, the word love there in verse uh, 18 is agape. Agape. And that's a whole other thing we can talk about sometime. 
Why? Most troubling verse in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Speaking of the Holy Jesus, the, the Son of God, He hath made Him to be sin for us. You and I do not have the capacity to imagine what that means. That a holy God allowed Himself to be made sin in our behavior made sin for us, who knew no sin, that he might be made to the righteousness of God in him. Staggering. By the way, that story back there in Numbers 21 led to a legend among the Greeks called Aesculapius. He was presumably in the Greek thing, a skilled physician who practiced Greece around 1200 BC. That's about several centuries subsequent to the one we read. And that's described in Homer's Iliad, actually. But uh, Aesculapius. So the legend of Aesculapius among the Greeks is really an echo of Numbers 21 among the Hebrews. Okay, and that became a symbol of medicine. You've probably seen this, uh, a, a, a snake on a, on, a, on a rod. That comes, that's not Aesculapius. Before that, it really comes from Numbers 21. And he's considered among the Greeks the god of medicine. Now, and you've probably seen this on some sign or symbol for medicine. Now, in America, they have a way of messing things up, okay? Some guy who was designing a, a symbol thought it would look better with two, you see. So, he put two uh, snakes on a pole because it looked more symmetrical. And so, in America, you see that on, uh, on doctor's license plates as a symbol of medicine. But that's not Aesculapius. That happens to be Hermes. And Hermes is a guide to the underworld. Uh, he's the, uh, he is the guide, he's the uh, symbol of commerce in general. And it's the caduceus, not the Aesculapius, it's caduceus. And uh, that it, 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 it's represented by two serpents. In Roman iconography, it, it, it depicts being carried on the left hand of Mercury, the messenger of the god. He's the guide of, the, he's the protector of merchants, shepherds, gamblers, liars, and thieves. So in America, when you see a license plate, it's more revealing than they had intended. I think. So, okay. So it's an integrated session. In the New Testament, is the Old Testament concealed? And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Okay. So we, we were trying to keep this down to uh, 30 minutes. And I think I've been able to do that pretty well. Let's see if I can. Yes, I can. Good. Oops, I didn't do that right. Okay, I didn't do that right. Hang on a second, I've messed up here. And uh, let's see if I can re retrieve myself here. Um, figure out how this thing works here. Yes, okay, now I hope I can get down here to there. Okay. Yes, good. We've just skipped another 30 minutes that way, so I keep it in the room. Okay. The key thought I'd like to leave you with is the integrity of the Word and also something else. And uh, Dr. William Welty and I have just published a book. It's coming off the press here in another week or two. It's a, a book with the most, the cheekiest title you can imagine. It's I, comma, Jesus, colon, an autobiography. In other words, we, we've put together an autobiography from Jesus' own words and, his, and, the, and the seven letters he wrote. Most people don't pay attention to the seven letters. The real point is most people have no grasp of who Jesus is. I'm talking about people in churches still have no real grasp of who he is. He's not a tradition, he's not a concept, he's not a, no, he's a living person who has a yearning. Now, that's a strange idea for me, that God can have a yearning. God can do anything he wants to do, it would seem. No, he has a yearning. The Lord Jesus Christ has a yearning. Do you know what that yearning is? It's mentioned in John 17. His yearning is for us to be with him. He's waiting for the Father to say, okay, go get him. And so, uh, now he also, by the way, has an, a, a final exam coming. I mean, we have a final exam coming with him. 
It's a scheduled appointment that you and I have. How many believe in the rapture? Can I see if you know eschatology? Okay, you're we're together on that one. Okay. What happens next? What happens right after the rapture? Not here on the earth, in the Father's house. What happens? There's a final exam. We're going to be on that exam. Everyone there will be saved. That isn't the issue. That's taken care of 2,000 years ago on a cross. What is being judged there? Our fruit bearing. Ooh, really? And that's all that's declared in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And uh, that's the rub. There's a final exam that we're going to. Are you ready for 2 Corinthians 5.10? That's a question. You know, I've got to find out what that's all about, okay? And do you get teached about what the Bema Seat really is? The procedure there is detailed for you in 1 Corinthians 3. There's a procedure by which your fruit bearing is going to be evaluated. You're saved already. That's not the issue. The issue is what have you done? How many of you are saved? Is he a show of hands? That's over 90%, Pastor. That's pretty good. The question is, what have you done with it? What, how many of you discovered your calling? Oh, see, you notice, notice there's some hesitation there. See, you know you're saved. Praise God. Praise God for that. The question is, have you discovered why? I believe every one of us that have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ are saved for a specific mission. And the adventure in life is to discover what it is. And let me tell you, for lots of reasons, it's time to get at it. Find out what it is and, and get at it. And, and it, that's all explained for you in 1 Corinthians 3. And don't confuse our responsibilities of bearing fruit with Jesus' completed work at Golgotha. Your salvation was paid 100% by Him on that cross 2,000 years ago. But the unknown at this point is, have you borne fruit? There are people that are saved, when they get to the Bema seat, will end up with a blank sheet of paper. Okay? There are others that uh, will receive their rewards as a resort for obedience. Have you been taught about the eminence and the realities of the coming kingdom? Not the kingdom of God. Mark, Luke, and John all talk about the kingdom of God. Great. Matthew alone uses a different expression. The kingdom from heaven. Of heaven in some translation should be from heaven. Kingdom from heaven. 33 times he uses that. Some commentators say, well, that's just he's Jewish. That's just for, chose for no. Five times he uses kingdom of God. 33 times he's using something more specific, something more denotative. You need to find out what that is. What is the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom from heaven. If you translate it properly, it's, tra it's, a, it's a genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. So it's the kingdom from heaven. See, if I say kingdom of heaven, that's fuzzy kind of concept thing. No, no. Kingdom from heaven has geography, has a capital, has a king, and has subjects. It's the fifth in list of five in Daniel chapter 2. It's the one that's going to replace all the others. And so it's a kingdom in the context of Daniel chapter 2. Check it out. See what you think. So I want to give you a personal challenge. Are these things relevant to you and prioritizing your life? Does it prioritize not only every day, every hour? That kingdom, that final exam that you're heading for is an issue. Shouldn't they be the primary prioritization of your life. Make him known. That's what we're called to do. Make him known. Have you? Are you making him known? Are you? Some of us have a miracle to speak to. For most of us, a miracle we get is hearsay. No, no, no. Your own. You need your own. Pray about it. Make this Passover season a time of fresh commitment, and we'd love to help you. So there is an organization that you should be aware of. It's not a seminary. It's not a replacement to your local church. It's a supplement where you can deepen your understanding of the Scripture. Our commitment for six decades has been 
to try to edify the body. We're not evangelistic. We are evangelistic, excuse me, but that's not our primary goal. We're edifiers. We're trying to repair the biblical illiteracy, not just in the general public, in the pews. In fact, even in some pulpits. So the Koine Institute is a think tank for serious Christians. It's not for everybody, but if you're really serious, you'll want to look it, into it. And my partner, Ron Madsen, you'll have some things out there for them. There's a little gift out there. You can get a free, some free stuff on a little sheet, and he'll explain all that out there. Did I get that right? Yes, they'll have all that. So our, our goal is to help you. If you're serious about your Bible, we'd like to help you understand it better. Non-denominational, but very fundamental. What we're bound by is not a statement of faith as much as a hermeneutic. In Matthew 5, verse 18, Jesus says, I've come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I, come, I came to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht is, a, is the smallest of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a little mark that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe or a blemish on the paper. A yacht is the... Of the 22 Hebrew letters in the Hebrew alphabet, it's just a little tiny mark. A tittle is the little hook on some of the letters that separates them. If you're doing that in English, you would say, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T shall pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. Now, what, that, what Jesus is telling us is to respect the text precisely. The, he, the rabbis have an interesting expression. They say, we won't, really won't understand the text until the Messiah comes. But when the Messiah comes, he'll not only interpret the very passages, the very words, he'll even interpret the letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. And when I first heard that, I smiled. It sounded like a typical exaggeration, a rabbinical suggestion. No, as I've studied more and more, I believe they're, they're close to the truth. And the whole concept of the... There, we now with computers have discovered the Bible in its original has properties that are fantastic. But if you remove one letter, they fall apart. And you realize that not only did God give Moses the Torah, he gave it to him letter by letter. And as you study your Bible, you'll discover there are passages and puns. There, there are figures of speech in it. Do you know how many different kinds of rhetorical devices are used in the text of the biblical text? There's similes, analogies, acrostics. There's how many different kinds do you think? Over 200. And they're all cataloged in our materials if you're interested in that. But the point is, what we hope you will develop as you study is a respect for the text itself, the originals. I'm not talking about paraphrases. I'm talking about faithful translations, and every translation has its problems. The good news is the older ones, you know, you know where they are, and they're well documented. But treat the text seriously. And with that, let's have a closing word of prayer. I think, did I make my 30 minutes? I think I did. Did we make it? Okay. That, 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 that goes in my baby book. Okay, good. Okay. Let's, let's, bow our hearts for a word, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for your presence. And Father, we pray that your purpose would be accomplished in every life in this building, that your will, your destiny for us would be fulfilled by your word and through your Holy Spirit. And as we commit all of this into your hands, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus our Messiah indeed. Amen.